right. you know, they'll let us know if we're. You're good. But we're good. We're live. Hey, so most, some of you know, some of you don't know, that when Dave was a senior in our church youth group, I was a junior in our church group. Long youth group. time ago. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Eighth, eighth grade. grade. You weren't, okay. Eight. So she was, but we were all in the same youth group. Carol's just, just, just is we're by proxy, by oh, proxy, yeah. oh, she's God. part of it. But when we would drive the bus around, we would, wherever we go to activities, we would sing a, 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 a mixture of songs called the hash chorus. So you music people will get us on the note and then we're going to do it for you. The hash chorus. Dan, if you're watching, sing, sing at your house. Everybody sing. Here we go. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saint of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. church youth group, Pastor Greg was four. <laughs> or, 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 you know, uh, yeah, right? Wait, if I was a junior, that's not, that might have been about right. A little less. He might have been, if I was a junior and I was, I, I was 17 when I was a junior. 
And you say, yeah, he was four. Four. Anyhow. I don't know if that's why I didn't get asked to be included. <laughs> did you know the words? I did not know any of the words, and I certainly didn't know any of the tune. That's probably more why I didn't get asked to be part of the uh, quartet there. Um, and now I'm all by my lonesome just to sit here with you all and, and do some Bible trivia. So I was trying to figure out what did I want to, what was the theme going to be for tonight? So I went on Google and said, you know, are there any special days today? And pretty much every day they make up something to be National Something Day. Oh, yeah. But this isn't just national. This is, today is International Skeptics Day. Oh. Which I thought was kind of fishy. Um, so, in honor, not honor, but because that gave me the idea of what to do for trivia, in honor of all the skeptics out there, we're going to do some skeptics Bible trivia. So all the... Uh, Questions are, are basically who. You got to tell me who's being referred to here. It's no fill in the blank. It's no extra, you know, know the verses. You just have to tell me who is being referred to. And each person was skeptical in one reason or, you know, for one reason or another uh, in the situation they were in. All right. Is that all? Does that make sense? Sound fishy? All right. Well, if it does, then you're in the right place. All right. We'll start off. It's probably easier to give you an example than to explain what it is I'm doing. I just need to tell you who's being referred to here. Now, the king to me of all skeptics in, in church history would, would be, in my opinion, Doubting Thomas, right? Even his name is associated with him being skeptical. I think he gets a bad rap, though. He got yeah. singled out when I don't know if he was the only one that could have been, you know, labeled as a skeptic. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself had, had words to say otherwise. So it says, afterward, he, spoke, speaking about Jesus, Jesus appeared to these guys themselves, as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. So who did Jesus give a hard time to? Because they, as a group, did not believe those who saw him. Remember, the first people to saw Jesus, it was Mary Magdalene, it was a group of women. They came, they reported it, they didn't believe them. And then Jesus appeared to two other disciples, right? It says on the road to Emmaus. When they came and told, they didn't get believed either. So it wasn't just Thomas. Who was being referred to as they were reclining a table and he rebuked them for their unbelief? Anybody want to venture a guess? Mike? All the, all the apostles. Yeah. Do you matter how many were left? Eleven. Eleven. Good. Yeah. It says <laughs> actually in Mark in the uh, NIV version, it says the eleven. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven. They weren't the twelve anymore, right? Judas had taken care of that. Um, but the 11, it wasn't just Thomas who didn't believe, right? It was all of them. So Thomas was the most vocal about it, and, and he wanted to see hard proof. And, you know, he, he became very convinced. But anyway, if you got that right, give yourselves 11,000 points, right? One for each of the people who did not believe, which we're honoring the skeptics tonight. <laughs> all right, now you need to know who is speaking in this verse. He said to the woman... Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Right? He was skeptical of what God actually said. That's not a good thing to be skeptical of, usually. So who said that? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Could it be... <laughs> the serpent? Satan? Yes, very good. All right? Uh, it was... The deceiver, yes, he said. And what was he trying to do? He was trying to put doubt in the mind of, of Eve and Adam. Did God really say, you know what? He's still doing that, isn't he? He's always trying to cause us to doubt God's word. All right? That's not the right kind of skepticism we want to see. But if you got that right, give yourselves um, 13,000 points because that's an unlucky number and that should go to Satan, right? Um, all right, next one. This is a New Testament one. It says, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. So the disciples were skeptical of this guy at Jerusalem. Anybody know who's being referred to here? When he came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and they did not believe he was a disciple. They thought he was, it was a trick. I'm hearing it back here. Who, who's whispering back there? Saul. 
I didn't see a hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alma, Alma. <laughs> Alma, what, what was your answer? Saul. It was Saul who would later become Paul, right? But before he had the reputation of being a disciple, you know, he already had a previous reputation of being somebody who was not really thrilled with the disciples and was taken into prison and, and even putting them to death. So he he was truly converted. He, he was ministering to people, but when he came to Jerusalem, they all thought, ah, this guy, he's he's a double agent. He's just trying to uh, to figure out who the real Christians are so he can get us. So at first they didn't believe him. And, and if you remember, it was Barnabas who actually spoke up and said, no, he, he's the real deal. Let him in. All right. So if you got that right, give yourselves um, 21,000 points. And even Alma can yeah. have the 21,000. Oh yes, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I am the teacher's parent. There you go. <laughs> All right, we'll go back to the Old Testament here. Who said this? Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Somebody was skeptical, but didn't take too much to convince him. Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Who was the speaker in this message? Becky? Isaac. Isaac, yes. Yes. Isaac. That's why you didn't say it. Isaac was the father of Jacob and Esau. If you remember, he, he, had, he was older and he was blind. And in order to deceive his father... You know, Jacob went in with what he said was venison, which apparently was really just lamb or goat that his mother made up. So apparently not only was his eyesight gone, but his taste buds weren't there either. Um, and Jacob pretended to be Esau so that he could get the blessing. And apparently he liked the soup enough that he said, okay, you must be Esau, even though the voice. So he, he had reason to doubt, but he didn't give in to his suspicion. So that was Isaac. And we find that in Genesis 27. So if you got that right, give yourself 27,000 points. I'm sorry for, again, my, my phone is not seem to be giving me people at home answering. So it uh, looks like Jack Gabriel got that one right. But I can't seem to keep my phone on for some reason. So um, we'll just keep going. I will stay in the Old Testament here. Um, now, this person was someone who was skeptical when, when God was speaking to him. So he was asking for more. He said this to God. Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me just test once more with this fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only. On all the ground, let there be dew. So someone was skeptical of God, and he kept wanting to, to, to test God to make sure what he was saying was, was really true. So I'll read it one more time. Who said this? Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please, let me test just once more with the fleece. Let it be dry on the fleece only, and all the ground, let there be dew. Carol. Gideon. Gideon, Gideon. yes. Gideon, remember when, when, when the angel Lord appeared to Gideon and says he, he was threshing wheat, but he, he was doing it in the wine press. Like he, he was hiding, and he said, blessed be you, you know, almighty man of valor. And that was kind of, I think, the Lord kind of poking fun at him because he was hiding scared. And he said, you mighty man of valor, but I also think God sees who we will be, not always who we are in the moment. And uh, he said, I'm here to tell you that you're going to be God's deliverer. And he said, well, let me let me test if it's really you, show me a sign. And if you remember, he prepared food for him, and, and the Lord sent down fire, and it devoured the sign. That wasn't enough. So then he asked for a fleece. He First he asked for the, um, the uh, fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry, and the Lord allowed that to happen. He said, let me just, one more time, Lord, let me just really, really make sure. Um, but the Lord uh, gave in to Gideon's testing, and he used him to be the deliverer. So if you got that right, give yourself 60,000 points. Mm. Man. All right, we'll go to the New Testament. This one's tougher, I have to admit. If you can identify this person, you are a good Sunday school student. This comes from the book of Acts. Uh, it says, it tells us Peter was in prison one time, right? And they, it, the, a group was gathered to pray for his release, for his deliverance, right? So as they were praying, we find out, you know, as that's happening, an angel appears to Peter. Peter thinks it's a dream. And it's not until he's outside the prison that he realizes this is real. 
And so Peter's outside the prison. He says, I'll go where I know to go, where all the disciples are. He goes there and says he knocks on the door, right? Servant girl answers the door, sees that it's Peter, and in her excitement, she shuts the door, leaves him outside, and goes in to tell everybody, hey, Peter's here, everybody. And this is what they said to her. They said, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so and kept saying, and they kept saying, it is his angel. So these people have enough faith to pray for Peter's release. They just don't have enough faith to believe that God's going to answer them. <laughs> right? So they're in there praying. Peter shows up at the door. The girl says, ah, it's Peter. <laughs> Leaves him out. This is funny. The Bible's funny. Um, she goes in and they say, you're crazy. Right? You, that can't be Peter. It's easier to believe it's his angel than it's actually Peter. What was the name of the servant girl? Hilda. Oh, we got another not hand raiser. I'm going to have to. <laughs> Can I see a hand, Mr. Mark? Oh, okay. Yes, please tell me your answer again. Rhoda. Rhoda, yes. And then we learned she later became best friends with Mary Tyler Moore. Yes, yes she did. So she, she, big things happened to her after she let Peter into the house. But yes, her name was Rhoda. 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 And she was skeptical, but not her so much as the rest of the disciples were skeptical that it was Peter. And I will give everyone 70,000 points, except Mr. Mott. You get negative 10 points for calling out. Oh, goodness. That's a cultural thing, raising. Yes, yeah, apparently like calling out, yes. It's a very Kazakh thing to do. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll go to the Old Testament again. Who said this? The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. Behold, the half was not told to me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report that I heard. So someone came to visit so she could see with her own eyes. And she said, what I was told wasn't true. Not even the half can describe it. Who was speaking there? Dave. Queen Dave, do you have food in your mouth? I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very unruly class tonight. I tell you, you know, it's a real disciplinary problem. Dave, if you're going to be sneaky enough to eat in class, please don't choose to answer questions <laughs> while you are chewing. <laughs> yes, it was the Queen of Sheba. That is who was speaking. So I will give everyone that was found in 1 Kings chapter 10, 78,000 points for that. Dave, I'm going to need you to see me after class. Oh. <laughs> and now we have speaking while the teacher is speaking. Between. Boy. It's, a, it's amazing how the, the bad kids find each other. Dave and Jonathan. Calling it out to each other across the room. I'm going to need you both to see me after class. Please. All right, we'll go back to the New Testament. Who said this? Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? All right, he just told her that. And she said, Yeah, Lord, I believe. And then he said, Take away the stone. He said, Lord, I'm trying to help you out here. <laughs> He's going to stink. I love the King James. He stinketh. <laughs> he continues to stink. Who was the one trying to give Jesus advice on, on how he should do his miracles? Anybody know? I'm just going to take another shot, huh? Martha. Martha. Very good. It was 50-50, it was right? Mary or Martha? Which one was he talking to? Martha was the practical one. And she said, Lord, I don't I don't want to I don't want to embarrass you in front of all these people, but you know, if I take away the stone, not only is he still gonna be dead, but he's gonna smell really bad. And the same thing Jesus said to her, I believe he's saying to us, Did I not tell you if you believe you'll see the glory of God? We see so much glory of more glory of God when we believe than when we live in disbelief. If you got that right, give yourself seventy seven thousand points, except Dave and Jonathan. We forfeited all points tonight. All right, last question uh, from the New Testament, the Gospels. Uh, who who uh, was being spoken to in this case, not spoken, speaking? As soon as Jesus, someone came and spoke to the person, as soon as Jesus overheard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And actually, if you, if you translate it correctly, he says, stop fearing, 
keep believing. So who was Jesus speaking to? He was a ruler of the synagogue. It tells us his title, but does anybody know his name? His name's a little tougher. Bill? Jairus. Jairus, yes. Or, or Jairus, how are some people pronounce it? I would say Jairus. Mark chapter 5, if you remember, his daughter was ill. He had a 12-year-old daughter, and it was in Capernaum. And Jesus was at the city. And this man, who was the ruler of synagogue, he, he, he was a big wig in town, and he was somebody that people looked up to. He knew who he needed to get. He went to Jesus. And he said, well, I, if you come, I know my daughter can be healed. So Jesus was on his way. He had stopped to deal with another woman who had an issue. And in that process, as they were moving back towards Jairus' house, the servants came and said, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. <clears throat> right? And I can imagine how Jairus' heart must have sank and been crushed. Right? Darkness and despair had taken over. And Jesus, he overheard, because they didn't say it directly to him, but he overheard, and he just simply turned and said, Stop fearing, keep believing. So to all us skeptics who are there, sometimes it's good to be skeptical. We don't want to be a fool. But when Jesus' voice comes to us and says, Stop fearing, keep believing, that's what we need to hold on to. So if you got that right, mm. give yourselves... 118,000 points, add them all up, share your points with your neighbor, points palooza tonight, right? Mm. Except no sharing with me. Yeah. <laughs> and now Christine is going to come and do another missionary update for us. Thanks, Christine. Hello. Hello. So up until this point, I've actually done 19 missionary moments. And just so you know, it's not the easiest to communicate with all of our missionaries. Becky is right on it when you communicate with her. But because of where they are location-wise, we don't often get the updates immediately. So today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I'm just going to share how um, Emmanuel, about 10 years ago, and I'm sure there were short-term missions trips before I started, th started going on them. But about 10 years ago was my first missions trip. And I'll never forget the day Laura Whiteman had actually gotten up and made an announcement that she wanted to go to Oaxaca, Mexico and lead a missions trip. And I left and I was like, I think I really want to go on that. Never been on a missions trip before. I imagine they're all missionaries just hand out Bibles in whatever country they're <laughs> in. I literally had no idea. So I went to the first meeting and I was super excited because Kathleen Thompson was there. And Kathleen and I had just started talking. We weren't really that friendly yet, but... Um, who would have thought that 10 years later we would have run um, eight short-term missions trips from Emmanuel together. Mm -hmm. So what had happened was because of reasons beyond her control, Laura could no longer attend that missions trip to Oaxaca, Mexico. We had about 11 people interested and we were about six weeks away and we're told that there was no tickets bought and we weren't going. But we had started raising money. Yeah. So we were like, all right, Lord, Kathleen, do you know anything about missions? She said, no. She said, do you know anything about missions? I'm like, I guess they give out Bibles, but sure, I want to go to Mexico. Didn't really know Tom and Sandy Brown, but I wanted to get to know them. So um, I realized very quickly that missionaries certainly don't just hand out Bibles, although that is a very important part of sharing the gospel. But when I started to know our missionaries, I realized that Terry Camlin is a teacher, Tom Brown is a maintenance worker, Corey Berber is basically a father figure to all the girls who come in. Jeremy Montgomery is a businessman. So there's so many different aspects to being a missionary. So long story short, Kathleen and I got together. We got a flight, went to Oaxaca, get on the plane. I get off the plane. Everyone is standing there with machine guns, yelling at me in Spanish. <laughs> I burst out into tears. I don't want to be here. What am I doing here? And then the next day when the sun came up, the Lord put it all in perspective. And we were there with 11 of us, and we started doing a lot. Over the next few weeks, I'm just going to share some of the missions trips that we have taken personally um, with our teams at Emmanuel, which have ranged anywhere from 18 to about 26 um, once we got into them. Our first one was the smallest one. And um, once the sun came up, we started working, and Kathleen and I got a paintbrush, and we were painting a church, and we met a great family, and we were doing all these wonderful things. And about a week into it, Sandy Brown called Kathleen and I to her office. So we were in trouble, Pastor Craig. And I'll never forget, she sat across from us and said, do you have any idea what you're doing? And we were both like, not at all. <laughs> like, we have no idea what we're doing. And um, we call her our missionary mom because she basically taught us how to run a short-term mission trip. And I want to say that every year from then, the Lord just continued to give us 
more wisdom and more strength and more wonderful relationships mm -hmm. with our missionaries, um, that it makes it more and more exciting to go on each trip every mm -hmm. year. And I know that every missions trip that I go on, I say, Lord, you're never going to top that. And then he does. Huh. And um, so in the next few weeks, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about that. But I just wanted to say that one thing that we have done at Emmanuel, which I think might be a unique um, thing that we've done, that I think many of the missionaries have told us, is trying to build our team before we even get there. That was our biggest mistake in 2011. We got there with 11 people who we knew from the church pews, but we didn't know how to share a kitchen and a bathroom and one room with all these 11 people. And we realized through that that our missions trips should be missions trips before we even go on the trip. It's not just two weeks in July. It's not just two weeks in August. It's the year leading up to it. It's all the times we get together to meet with each other and pray with each other. And um, we have since all of our missions trips take at least a year of planning. Every month we get together. We were able to Skype with our missionaries now, so we even get to know them before we get there. So I'm super excited to see where the Lord takes us next, and I'm hoping the Lord pushes COVID aside so we can get there. Yeah. Becky is uh, rooting on Kazakhstan, and I would go there in a heartbeat. Um, and that's the other thing. I feel like every time we plan, like, Lord, where do you want us to go? One of our missionaries actually contacts us and says, we need someone to come. So we have actually been asked by a few people now. I know Becky is rooting for Kazakhstan, and the Burbas are rooting for Romania. And now our new friends, the Fishers, are rooting for Nicaragua, and I would go to any one of them tomorrow. But um, definitely keep all the missionaries on your prayers and in your heart, um, because they do amazing work. Mm. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, Christine, for sharing that. I know that uh, my wife Greta and daughter Natalie went on one of those the, uh, I don't know how many trips you've taken to Oaxaca. They went on one of them, and um, not the first one. And I've learned that if that happens again, not to plan our week of vacation the week they get back, because <laughs> they brought a bug back, and that that you know that that I don't mean a a bug bug. I mean in their body bug, you know that kind of left them from uh, from from you know being able to really enjoy the vacation. Anyhow. Good thing we're not on live stream. <laughs> Good segue. <laughs> anyway, that was, uh, anyhow, let's, let's, let's get, you know, I want to ask you something. That leads me to this next question. <laughs> How do you refer to your aunts and uncles, right? <laughs> what order do you say their names in? What I, I was thinking about it, right? Because uh, I, I didn't know if, if every family is like ours. Or most are in that. I I didn't. Growing up, we would state our aunts and uncles based on who was biologically related. So, in other words, on my mother's side, I would say Uncle Bill and Aunt Maureen because Bill was my mom's brother. But I would say Aunt Dot and Uncle Andy because I guess because that that was you know just the way it was always landed on our ears. So it was. Uncle Bill and Aunt Maureen, Uncle Jack and, and Aunt Alice, you know, because the, they, were, they were her brothers. But when it came to, it was Aunt Ruth and Uncle Steve, because Aunt Ruth was my mom's sister. Same with my dad's side. Uncle Marty and Aunt Betty. Marty was my dad's brother. But I didn't say Uncle Ronnie and Aunt Rita. I said Aunt Rita and Uncle Ronnie, because Rita was my, did, did, you, did you find yourselves in your families the same way? I didn't know if it was kind of, you know, what we, we, uh, you know, just it was just something that just naturally happens with families, you know, that were it referred to the sibling first. But anyhow, how you say a name, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm tying that into how you see a name. Because one of my aunt's names uh, is, I'm going to start seeing it a little different. I have an Aunt Addie. And I would always say Uncle Jim and Aunt Addie, because Uncle Jim is my mom's <laughs> brother. Addie is his wife. Love my Aunt Addie. Just a, I, I don't ever remember Aunt Addie being, at least a bit angry or harsh, always kind of a, a fun sense of humor, sometimes like that little sarcasm, you know, but, but my Aunt Addie, love my Aunt Addie. But the name I see, when I, you say Addie, my Aunt Addie, that's who I see. But I have a feeling that's 
going to change because one of the little girls that is inside my daughter's body right now, one of the twins are going to be named Addie. And I thought, wow, my Aunt Addie is clearly going to be pushed way back to being the second, <laughs> the second in line. Be, be, you know, when I, when our granddaughter Addie, you know, is, is, it enters into our world, uh, in the upcoming, you know, months, but, um, how you see a name, right? How you say a name, how you see a name, our names, how they identify us, how we respond to them. Some of you read the daily bread and I think it was the very first of October. Daily Bread had an article, like their little article, What's Your Name? And they were listing kind of how we have different names. I'm going to expand on it over the next few minutes. But the first name is obviously the name that you're given by your parents. Now, I guess there are some people who say I, they, don't, they don't literally don't like their name. I, 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 I was, I was named Vincent. So to me, growing up, Vincent was a wonderful name. It was my name, right? You know, it was you know, I, how, how I was identified sometimes as Vincent and sometimes as Vincent, you know, or whatever. But, you know, that sense of the name that we're given. Of course, Greg's trivia often ties in uh, to, to where I'm going with, you know, about in Scripture. And in Genesis chapter 25, we read an example of that, right? An example of parents giving their children a name. Genesis 25, verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment. They named him Esau. And afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding onto Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And we know that the name Esau uh, literally means Harry. Uh, his other name that he's given, what, verse 30, Edom, right? Edom is the word red, and, and, and that'll be the kingdom that ultimately comes from him, right? Uh, but Jacob, the word can mean to follow behind, uh, to overtake, to supplant, or as one definition says, one who takes by the heel, right? And so we have them, Having their children, evidently, their names, they weren't, they didn't, three weeks before, they weren't saying, oh, they're going to be Esau. And they named them on the spot based on the, the, the experience of the child, identifying factors, right? Our third child, Natalie, was obviously, Greta knew she was going to, was due like the day or so before Christmas. Natalie actually was born on the 22nd of December. And Greta had thought I want to name her something with that. And Natalie comes from nativity. Uh, you know, it's, it's the birth of our Lord. And, and so her name ties into kind of the timing of her birth. But we get names. We have a name. I believe that God's sovereignty cooperates with, you know, if that's the right word, with our human experience. And the name that my parents gave me is the name that I will be. That, that, that's who I am. I'm Vincent. That God knows me as Vincent, right? That's the name that I was given. And we certainly have every reason biblically to think that because in Exodus chapter 3, uh, we see that no Moses sees a burning bush and he says, I'm going to go over and he hears out of the bush, Harry. No, he hears what? Moses. God calls Moses by the name that his parents gave him. You are Moses. He says it there in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4, right? We read there, the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Same thing, you go to Luke chapter 1, you may already know who's, who's going to be referred to here, but in Luke chapter 1, um, we are told that the angel Gabriel, verse 27, came to a virgin, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, the descendant of David, 
And the virgin's name was Mary. And what happens in verse 30? The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The angel refers to Mary as, as, as Mary. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus Christ is on the earth. He's, he's, reach, he's, he's impacting lives. And in verse 5, that famous verse that many people will find familiar, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And so we have names. Now maybe you would say, I don't like my name. I'm literally going to be called that all throughout eternity. I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to build a doctrine or, or, on it, but it, it's it's who we are. You know, when Jesus is referring to people, he calls them by the name. When Moses and Elijah appear at the transfiguration, they are Moses and Elijah, right? I, I've always found great comfort Again, not trying to build a doctrine per se, but just the practical reality. In the transfiguration, Moses doesn't appear as a rainbow and Elijah doesn't appear as, as, as a sunflower. They're, we're we're going to see each other in heaven. We're going to recognize our humanity, right? And I believe that in heaven, you're going to see me and you're going to say, that's Vince. That's a, you're, you're, you're not going to think there's something about you that makes me feel like I knew you. You're going to recognize me. I'm going to recognize you, right? Just as they did. We have a name that's given to us. But there's a second name, and it's a name that kind of Proverbs 22 refers to. Uh, and it's really what? It's our reputation. It's the name that other it's the name that we've built, the name that others have come to know us by. Proverbs 22 and verse 1. A good name is to be more desired than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. A good name. That's not meaning like, oh, wow, yeah, Vincent, that's really a good name. It's meaning the name, right? The reputation that we build. A great, great example being Daniel, right, in the Old Testament uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, back there. And in Daniel chapter 6, when we read, then the commissioners in verse 4 and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God, that we, that we know he's going to be faithful to his God. What a name. What a, what a reputation. This man is such a man of integrity, such a man of, 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 of high, you know, uh, just highly valued in all of his qualities, what a name to be built, right? We build reputations. We do. Um, I can remember during those youth group years and playing for the church basketball team and played for school as well. But for, you know, and I can remember in the church league, you know, the first game of the season one year. And I said, what? Technical foul on me. Nobody gets a technical just for saying what. And uh, the person who was coaching our, our, our church basketball team said, Rev, Rev, what, what did he do? And the ref just said, doesn't matter what he did. We know this guy. He's a hothead. He's a hothead. We know him. And, oh, and I thank God for my father. My dad kind of was very, you know, he wasn't a father said that we like, that's not fair that my son was treated that way. No, he was a father who said, look, you've built a reputation. And you may not think it's fair, but when you build a reputation, people are going to hang that around you and you're going to have to unbuild it. You're going to have to rebuild. It's going to take time. And it doesn't matter if all year you never say anything to the ref. It may take more than a year because you've built 
a reputation. You build a name. And so we have in the New Testament, Barnabas, that's a great name, son of encouragement. What, what a name. We know that the name his parents gave him was not that, right? It was Joseph. Right? Joseph. And, but Barnabas, son of encouragement. And again, James and John, sons of thunder. They get upset quick. They're ready to, you know, set things straight, you know. And we care about it. And we should. Because Proverbs reminds us that, um, that, 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 you know, if our if the reputation name that gets associated with my name, if Vincent is known as greedy, or Vincent is known as unfaithful, or Vincent is known as you know, that it's 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 it's, it's a problem, right? Proverbs remind us what a great name to have a good reputation. But there's a third name that I think that's even more important than that, and I I refer to it as character. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. They were already talking about Daniel's character. They were talking about Daniel's reputation, what they knew of him. I think character is what you know about yourself. Character is the name that you know it, 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 that, that you wear, right? Because you can fool others. You can have a reputation. We're, we're well aware of that. The reputation of being godly, of being this, that. And behind the scenes, there is a lack of character, right? That doesn't that that doesn't stand up. But true character, true character is when you lay down and put your head on your pillow at night, and you know who you really are in the eyes of God, right? Uh, that, that 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 ability to say, "Oh, Lord, it isn't." It, 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 I, it, I don't have peace putting my head on a pillow at night with God because I fool other people into them all thinking that I'm generous when really I've been stealing from the church offerings. That was, that, if you just turned on the video, that I haven't been. That was not a <laughs> confession. That was a, you know, a sense of like, but that that's, that, that, you know, character. It's I think it's what the Apostle Paul is not arrogantly, but humbly referring to when he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1, right? In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, when Paul declares about himself, verse 12, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul's emphasis is on the Lord. But he's also saying, I know in my heart that it's all been genuine with me. I know it's been real. I think about back in the book of Daniel again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 12 we read, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. They're attacking their reputation. Now, sometimes we have a great name, reputation, but we know the name of our character doesn't really stand up behind closed doors. Sometimes... We may not have a good name reputation because we're being lied about and slandered because of the fact that we really do have a good character. We really are living in a genuine way like they were, right? And, and, and we read in verse 17, I love this phrase because we read that they answer Nebuchadnezzar, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. These are three fellows who are very confident in their genuine character. We know how we have served the Lord. There's no part of, yikes, we're, faith, we're facing death. All right, we'll come clean. They're like, we, we know... We are so at peace with our character 
with who we are, what our real name is with God, that doesn't matter what you say or do to us, right? We know, we know who we are in God's eyes. The name we're given, the name that we sometimes build with others, our reputation, and it's good to have a good reputation. The name of character, the name that we know, I know in my heart whether the name hypocrite applies to me or not, right? You know in your heart, like that, that, that sort of. But then fourthly, the new name God gives us. That we, when we do come to him, I get different names in essence, or you may say they're not really names, but that become even more important to me than the name Vincent. Even though I, I believe, I honestly believe you're going to know me as Vincent for all eternity, right? But this name of, there's a verse that might bring out the question. We're going to touch on that. But this name of what, uh, for example, of what? Well, in John chapter 1, when we are told he came unto his own and his own received him not, right? John chapter 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I've been named a child of God. John says in 1 John 3, see how great a love the Father has for us that we should be called children of God. That, that we take on that name, child of God. Wow. John chapter 10, Jesus gives us another name. I know it's not like an official formal name, but I love the name in John chapter 10 and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I've been named by Christ as one of his sheep. That's a good shepherd I'm one of his sheep. And I believe that when we look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17, someone may, you may even be sitting there saying, well, I think we're going to be called something else because of this verse. In Revelation 2, 17, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. Could that mean we're all going to get, like, you know, Jesus is going to say to Greg, you're, you're now lemon tree. I'll call you lemon tree. Lemon tree, if I say lemon tree. That's a Seinfeld thing. If you, though you Seinfeld fans out there, anyhow. But I, 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 the, the new name, is it going to be like, you know, like with Cephas, you're Peter. Like, I honestly think, it's my name, but it's in a whole new setting. It's on this stone that declares I'm now without sin. There's never been a Vince McDonald without sin. But, but you know, when it, I, there's different, different Bible teachers have different understandings of the stone. And, you know, one of, one of the historical things was that jurors sometimes would put forward a, a, a stone to, to acquit a person like that was their verdict, you know, they put a stone forward. Sometimes a stone was acquired, literally a, a, a white stone entrance into a particular banquet or whatever, you know, a designated stone. But the point being, when we read that and you say a new name, I think that new name, for me, I, I think it ties in some with what we read in Philippians chapter four, right? Philippians chapter 4, when he says um, about where that name is written down, verse 3, Indeed, true comrade, I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I know we're dealing with Greg and I sat on an ordination council last week and, you know, you're asking a guy questions about the omniscience, the Trinity of God. And, and we're, uh, I, I, it, was, it was a good council to be on because they were, I, I was glad everyone had a, a sense of camaraderie and humility that we know we're asking you questions about a God that we don't have all the answers. You know, that, that this God, he has revealed things to us that go beyond our human comprehension 
you know, but that sense of, you know, yes, God's always known my name. God always knew somehow that Leo and Kay were going to name me Vince. And that's always been my name. But to me, that new name, in a sense, it's what? It's, now it's, it's given to me on a stone, on a, on an, on an, a, a, a gift of entrance into the kingdom. And this is a Vince without sin. This is a Vince it's never existed before, right? A Vince with a new name. I don't know if it's in that old hymn, though, but I, I don't know if it was in the first hymn, though, but I remember singing. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And it ends by saying, All my sins are forgiven. I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Vince, named by my parents. But Vince named in a new way, written down in glory. Father, we thank you so much for the name. Let, let us rejoice in the new name you've given us above all. But Lord, let it cause us to live out a, a, a name of character, a name of reputation that, that would, would be consistent with the name that you have called us to be. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's a new name written down in glory. All righty. So we have our prayer sheets here. Uh, I want you folks to know um, Ella Hankel, our dear, dear Ella, she has her stone and new name. She has passed to be with the Lord. Now, I don't, I, 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 I'm waiting for a return call from her nephew. But her graveside funeral is this coming Saturday. 11.30 at Colestown. So if you'd like to be there at the graveside funeral, you know, we'll probably be at the graveside 15 minutes to 30, maybe 15 to a half hour, standing there, whatever. But it's, it's uh, if you're coming to Colestown, if you know it at all, there's the main entrance, but there's also an entrance a little further down on Kings Highway. That would really, it's going to be in, back in that section. So if you wish to be there for Ella Hankel, 11.30 Saturday, uh, I am I am waiting to hear back from her nephew, but uh, I believe she passed on this past Sunday because I got the phone call from uh, Mark Tillman, funeral director, on Monday. So we, we want to be, uh, we wanted you to be aware of, of that. Uh, I, I want to say a praise, number four on Thursday, Elwood Severs, uh, Elwood's wife, Marion, works in the township building. Some of our church family know them. Um, he has, he is, he's in a rehab, but he's really coming along. He was, they thought they were, they were going to lose Elwood and they're very grateful. They said, please express prayers to any who have been praying for him. And, and we thank God for that, that Elwood seems to be gaining new strength. All right. Marie Henry's friend, Rob, uh, we want to continue praying for him. He's battling cancer. Leanna Smoller, uh, she, her aneurysm, her surgery is set for the 19th of November. She's really trying to get it sooner because she's had seizures. She's, you know, uh, in, in some difficulty as well with her, her own house situation. So just be praying for her. George Hilde, as we said, is home from the hospital. Uh, get, you know, Re re recovering breathing treatments to clear up the infection that he had been battling. Number seven there, Gene Thompson on Saturday doing well. And uh, we, we, we were glad to hear that the, 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 the test results of no cancer in his bladder. Right above him, Lou Thorpe, as we said, he does have growth of the, the, the cancerous nodules in his lungs. So he's having to get uh, more chemo um, and so be praying. Uh, he's doing well physically. He's doing well. Like he wouldn't know it except that they've been doing these scans, but be praying for, uh, not only him, but for Miriam and, oh, you know, just, just the, the continual, it's been going through this for quite some time they have together. Tabitha Ford has an inoperable brain tumor. Uh, 
I, and, and has a great need to be accepted into the right group home very soon. So that's our prayer, that the Lord would open up the right group home for Tabitha. So be, be praying for her. Jackie De Silva uh, had a car, was in a car accident. She's doing well. She was in the office today. But be praying for her because Jackie's been looking for a job. But in the meanwhile, she's been doing some... Um, uh, oh, some of those, I've now the different Door food. Dash. Door dash, like delivery. Well, now she can't do that because her car, and literally they're telling her the repairs could take until the end of the month. Mm -hmm. So we'll just be praying for um, Jackie. Any prayer requests you have here in this room tonight? Mike, we're praying for you. And your Mike basically, his doctor told him there's nothing else to do for his back pain. And so... We just pray for God's grace for endurance for you. And then likewise for Floss, dealing with you. No. <laughs> yeah, and we want to ju just, just be praying unspoken prayer requests as well for their grandson. Uh, anybody else have uh, Alma? Yeah, my neighbor, Sally. Um, she and her husband are now saved. His mother lives with him, and she has Alzheimer's. And she is in that stage of Alzheimer's where she's very angry all the time. And she's calling other family members and really telling a lot of lies about Sally and her son. Kevin. Oh, boy. And it's really upsetting Sally. And she tends to lose her temper with her. So she comes over to my house when she's uh, ready to explode. But just for Sally and Kevin, they just need wow. a lot of prayer to deal with it. Okay. Anybody, if you have a prayer request and you want to send it in online, I'm sure somebody will let me know if, if you're praying. Be praying for Michelle Fox. Today she was in the doctor's office and they were removing uh, a significant uh, uh, tumor from her arm. If you want to say, but, um, and they'll, uh, awaiting results, but she doesn't think it's cancerous. But initially she reached out to me and said, look, I've about had, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I know her faith in the Lord has been great. And I, Michelle, if you're watching, I just thank God for your testimony and your faith. And we love you and Jonathan. And, uh, but be praying for Michelle that the results would not be, uh, uh, you know, cancerous. All righty. And if nobody else has a prayer request, uh, yeah. Okay, be praying for for Floss. She has a lump that needs to be biopsy. We will indeed be praying for her and for the peace that God can give surrounding all of that. Well, my hand will die one, one Sunday the 10th. Oh, you just... I just Googled it. Oh, okay. So Pastor Leo is <laughs> confirming that Ella Hankel did... Passed to be with the Lord on the tenth. He, he, uh, he. You know, his friend Google told him that. All right. Well, I'm going to close us in a word of prayer. Thank God for this day of life He's given us. Lord, we thank you for your care, for your blessings, for your presence. That you're with us. We get up from this room and we leave. You're with us. Wherever we go, never alone. Let that, 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 that truth just so solidify the hearts on our prayer sheet. These names we've mentioned for prayer. We, we, we commit ourselves into your ever-present care. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here with us online. God bless you. Good to see all you folks here with us tonight.